Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar on reinforcement learning in Minecraft challenge and opportunities in multiplayer games. My name is Diego Pérez Lievana. I'm, I'm a lecturer on computer games and AI at Cumbria University of London. I'm part of the Game AI group as uh, the same as two of my um, co-presenters uh, in this uh, webinar, Raluca Gaina and Martin Bala, who will talk after me. They're also part of the Game AI group. They are PhD students in, in Queen University of London. And then we have a final speaker, which is uh, Sam Devlin from Microsoft Research, who will close this presentation. Uh, during this webinar, we're going to talk about four main parts. The f in the first one, I'm going to introduce the main uh, concepts and ideas we have general game AI research. Uh, after me, Raluca Gaina will talk about different games that have been implemented in Minecraft and can be used for this particular uh, area of research. Uh, after Raluca, Martin Bala will be talking about how to train different reinforcement learning agents in uh, Malmo, the, the main uh, platform for uh, multi-platform game, multi-agent uh, games uh, in Minecraft. And finally, um, Sam Devlin will be talking about several open questions uh, and research that is happening at the moment in this, uh, in this domain. So starting with the first block, uh, general game AI research. Uh, traditionally, in, in game AI, uh, something that we have done quite useful, uh, quite often, is to uh, utilize different games and do, doing different research on those games. So, for instance, you could create an AI agent that is going to play one particular game. Could be uh, a game on a 3D game like Minecraft. Could be games, uh, two-dimensional games like, for instance, uh, Sequest. Or could be other um, navigational games in which you have to maybe control a ship in a in an environment and then uh, maybe visit a series of waypoints. Normally, the AI, the way it's focused, is you have a particular agent uh, and you try to create this AI so it plays the game uh, as, as best as, as it can. Um, while this advances the field, in many cases we are interested in similar approaches that could uh, focus on one AI agent that is able to play multiple games. This allows the researchers to focus exclusively um, on the AI methods, on the actual technology behind the agents, uh, rather than in specifics on every game. So we can advance AI in order to um, to make uh, AI methods that are applicable to many different domains and not only one particular one. Examples of this uh, can be found in the literature. One uh, example you might have heard of is uh, the work on uh, the Atari learning environment uh, with uh, using uh, deep convolutional neural networks and deep QNs that allow you to uh, receive as an input the image of the game and then analyze it, try to extract features automatically and then map that to the different outputs that the agent can take, essentially the actions that the agent can take in the game. And then by progressively and repeatedly uh, playing these games, it's able to learn and it's able to play better and better uh, as time progresses. Another example for, could be the general video game AI framework and competition. This is something that we have developed at Queen Mary. And essentially the idea is that you can play multiple arcade games in, in a fashion in which you don't have to train on them. You have access to the model of the game and you can plan which are the best actions. And you can play multi multiple games like could be Space Invaders or Chocoban or things more complex like, for instance, um, Portals or other games uh, like, uh, for instance, could be also uh, Butterflies or, or Zelda. Um, this uh, was uh, organized a competition and allowed people to train and prepare agents even not knowing the games that they're going to be playing with later on. In a more general case, more general example, we have Stratega, which is a, a general strategy games framework that we have been developing. This, for instance, try to, um, tries to tackle more complex situations in which you have uh, games that uh, require decision in multiple uh, dimensions. Like, for instance, you might be defining how to do um, research of different technologies, or you might be controlling multiple units that you need to be uh, managing at the same time. Or you might also try to, for instance, uh, manage economy or uh, playing against multiple enemies. In this case, we are developing this, this framework that allows you to play in multiple different strategy games at once and try to focus research on the difficult questions of decision making for this domain. But one clear example of, uh, of one, um, uh, one of the main platforms at the moment for multi-games uh, development is the project Malmo, which is developed by Microsoft and is using Minecraft as a platform for doing AI research. 
Um, you can find all the information in these links as well, but in general this uh, takes the game Minecraft with all these complexities to uh, offer a rich um, diversity of games that you can use for training and learning uh, learn with your agents in these environments. So the main design principles of Malmo are that they have a low entry barrier, so you essentially can uh, can create your own uh, agents in the, in the language that you prefer, could be Java, .NET, C, C++, Python or Lua. It's cross-platform, so you can essentially use it in multiple uh, operating systems like uh, well, Windows, Linux or MacOS. Uh, in general, it incorporates an API for agents, so you can uh, create uh, an agent biasing or basing your, your, um, your agent in several functions that you can implement in order to interact with the environment. The Actual environments as well can be created in XML, so you can essentially define how does the world look like, the type of objects, the type of elements that are incorporated into that, and also you can incorporate how is the task itself that you want to um, you want to develop. Like you can define the actions that are available for the agents. You can also define the different rewards that exist. How does the episode end? What do you have to do to win? Essentially. So given that you have all these uh, possibilities, uh, all these language to define different games. You, we are moving in Malmo from just executing agents in one particular domain to a range, to a wide range of domain that you can uh, that you can work on, and this allows us to focus in a more general uh, multitask learning rather than focusing on the narrow AI of one simple environment. Um, not only that, but also you can use uh, Malmo to have multiple agents in the same game. So, for instance, if you're playing maybe a football game or maybe capture the flag like the examples on the screen you could have multiple agents each one of them controlled by a different uh, AI algorithm or controller they are trying to either compete in the same game or trying to cooperate to achieve a common goal or even you could have a human who's playing with all these AIs and there is an interesting aspect on collaboration and competition between the AIs and the humans that can be also explored in this domain this is the introduction from Project Malmo uh, and now uh, Roluca Gaina is going to talk about the different agent, the different um, games that have been created, examples of tasks that are interesting for doing AI in this particular uh, environment. Thank you, Diego. Uh, my name is Aluka, and I will be talking about the multiplayer games available in the framework. We currently have three different games that are all parameterized with a procedural level generation behind them as well and that is to allow for many variations of each of the environments to be generated, to allow for diverse and challenging training settings for general players. The first game is Mob Chase, previously known as Peak Chase, which was used in a previous uh, Microsoft Collaborative AI Challenge. Uh, the point here is for two different agents to corner a mob in a fenced off play area. They get a large reward for catching the mob and a smaller individual reward if they move to an exit block instead, which could be the better choice if the uh, partner of the agent is not actually cooperating. In order to play this game, the agents have uh, three actions available here. Uh, they can move forward, backward or turn. Um, they have the, goal, the main goal of catching the mob, which rewards them the most uh, points and they have a secondary goal of reaching an exit, uh, which would also end the game, but award them a fewer number of points. And all of the games that we have here also have a maximum number of commands that can be sent by the agents. So this is to encourage them to actually complete the problems as fast as possible. With the current parameter options, uh, which can be easily modified and increased to cover more potentially interesting spaces, we can get over 6 million variations of mob chase, not including the various level layouts resultant from the chosen parameters. We can vary uh, the look of the game, the number of objects in the level, and their position within a varied size play area, all of which can be used to also tweak the difficulty of the game if needed. Uh, these are some examples of what the game is generated might actually look like in practice. Mob Chase specifically targets AI skills based on cooperation, chasing, navigation, and exploration. The next game that we're looking at is Build Battle, in which two different agents compete here to build a given structure. 
one agent placing a block correctly awards him points, which subtracts from the opponent. Here the agents can move forward, backward or turn, uh, but they can also jump and they can place or destroy objects. The main goal of the game is to copy the given structure which awards one point, but here we can also see a more granular reward structure which awards a small number of points for placing correctly some blocks or removing incorrectly placed blocks and the opposite for uh, placing blocks in incorrect positions or removing blocks that have already been placed correctly. And we have uh, an opposite reward scheme for the opponent. Here we can obtain over 10,000 variations of the game, not including different level layouts. And we're varying uh, things like the size of the structure to be built and the overall level size, the look of the game through the types of blocks used and the percentage of the structure that is already built for the players to generate interesting challenges of varying complexity. And to look at this game in action, we can see two different instances here. Build Battle specifically targets AI skills based on navigation, puzzle solving and resource management. And lastly, we have Treasure Hunt in which one agent is defenseless and has the mission of collecting treasure. The brightly, the brightly colored blocks in the pictures and videos shown here and then make it to the exit of the dungeon as well. The other agent is equipped with a sword and must protect the collector from the enemies as they navigate the dungeon together. Multiple teams of collector protector players could be added in the same game for an interesting competitive angle. And in this game, the agents can again move forward, backward or turn, but uh, they have also different abil abilities depending on their particular role in the challenge. The protector can attack enemies and the collector can interact with the items in the level and collect them. The goal uh, overall is for the collector to reach the exit. And we again see here a more granular reward structure with points awarded for each of the treasure blocks being collected, as well as um, agents uh, being penalized if any one of the ones in the same team die. Over 3 billion variations of this game can be created by varying the look of the game, combat aspects and the number of enemies faced, as well as the overall and detailed configuration of the dungeon. In these examples, we're only seeing some one room play areas, but larger and more complex dungeons can easily be generated. And this is what the game looks like in action. Treasure Hunt is one of the more complex scenarios that we have available, which uh, targets uh, many AI skills such as navigation, exploration, object transportation and escort, aiming, defeating enemies, chasing, fleeing, and obstacle and harm avoidance. Overall, the games that we have available in the framework pose a wide variety of challenges requiring the agents to exhibit many different skills in order to successfully solve all of the problems. Thank you very much for listening and I will pass on to Martin who will be tra talking about actually training agents to play such games. Thank you. Thank you, Ralka. Hi, my name is Martin Bala and after seeing how the missions are in Mamo, we turn our attention to how to get an agent to successfully play these games. So for this we use reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning an agent interacts with an environment. Initially the environment gives, gives the agent an initial observation and based on that observation the agent picks an action the action gets sent to the environment and the environment updates its internal state and returns the next observation with a reward. The agent's objective is to accumulate the highest discounted reward as it can. The observations in Minecraft are, the, are in the form of RGB pixels and the a action space in the simplest form can be moving 
one grid forward, turning 90 degrees left or right, and the reward is in the simplest case minus one or one. One is when the agent successfully completes a mission, and minus one when it fails. The next is to have a look at how to actually set up Malmo on your own machine. It got a bit simpler than with previous versions. So the first step is to get Java version 8 and Python 3 installed. Unfortunately, Minecraft runs with an older version of Java, so it requires Java 8 specifically. It wouldn't work with newer versions. And after you get Java and Python installed, the next step is to clone the repository. And if you got it cloned, then you can install Malmo env using pip and if you want to run the examples and the tutorials from the repository then you can optionally install the example sub package but if you want to get it to run on your own machine we refer you to your to the project readme so we use rlib for our examples rlib is part of the ray project you might have come across this as Ray is a popular Python package to speed up computation by parallelization. Uh, RLE provides high quality, state of the art, easily scalable RL algorithms. So you can run the same algorithm on your laptop and easily transfer it to a cluster and you just have to change the resources that you have available so you can specify more CPUs and more GPUs and RLIB automatically handles that and it supports both TensorFlow and PyTorch so if you don't want to learn the other framework it's not a problem. We prepared a few notebook tutorials to lower the entry barrier for Malmo we recommend you to go through in the order listed in the slide as they build from basic concept to more advanced ones. So the first tutorial is about how to run a random agent in Malmo. It shows you how to set up the environment and then it just samples random actions at each time step. The next tutorial shows how to use RLLib and run a PPO agent in a sample mission. Then we go through how to restore a checkpoint and how to evaluate the checkpoint. And finally, we are going to show you an example of how to run a multi-agent experiment in Malmo and RLib. The first notebook is about how to run a random agent in Malmo. So the first thing we have to do is create the environment calling malmoamp.make and then for the initialization we have to pass the mission file with a, a port and that port is going to be used to communicate between Java and the Python process and we have the launcher which automatically starts up the Java Minecraft instance um, it just requires an array of ports. In this example, we only use a single port and a launch script that we explain in the next slide. And then we can just use the normal reinforcement learning loop. And in this example, while the episode is not over, we just sample a random action at each time step. So it's worth highlighting how the launcher works. So previously you had to manually start up the Minecraft instances using a, a Gradle process for each environment that you wanted to use and instead we created a Python script that does it for you and the launcher takes in an array of ports and for each port it, it starts a new Minecraft instance and it also takes a launch script the launch script is a bash file that defines the launch options for Minecraft. So by default, it renders a window on your desktop. But 
that doesn't work on for example headless Linux machines if you want to train it for longer periods on a server and you can use XVFB to export the display and that helps you running it that was one of the issues that we had with the earlier versions of Malmo the next example is how to run a PPO agent in Malmo PPO is one of the state-of-the-art reinforcement learning algorithms it stands for Proxima Policy Optimization and we are using the Tune API that helps you run an experiment so it's quite straightforward to run it in the first line as the first argument you define the algorithm so in this case we use PPO then we give a config which is a Python dictionary that defines the algorithm's parameters so it defines the learning rate and the available resources so you can define how many CPUs you want to allocate and how many GPUs then we set the stopping conditions that it makes the training stop after a certain number of environment agent interactions and then we have some checkpoint argument that it creates a checkpoint at the end and also throughout training after every few iter algorithm iterations it makes a checkpoint and finally we set the log dir so everything that rlib logs it just saved at a specific place after training we can visualize the tensorbore output that rlib automatically saves we don't have to wait until the end of the training we can visualize it during training and we have some, a few examples of what kind of data we can visualize so it shows the average length the episode takes throughout training the maximum and the average rewards that it collected during the episode and RLib collects much more data so for example you can visualize even CPU usage or memory usage and sampling time in millisecond there are much more these are just a few examples and then after we train an agent we can visualize what it does the GIF on the right is recorded using the screen recorder that we also provide in the framework it takes the observations that the agent gets and saves them as a GIF or an MP4 file the, the mission was the single agent mob chase in this example the agent just has to navigate to the brick block that the agent does very nicely on the GIF so in the next tutorial we have a look at how to restore a reinforcement learning agent in Malmo so one use case for this is that you train an agent you have the checkpoint but you want to visualize what it actually learned so in this case you can just change the configuration that you, you may want to just use a single CPU and for example no GPU for the visualization you can switch off exploration so the agent picks the best action it can at each time step and then we can use the same ray.tune function as before but now on the last argument we use the restore flag and we provided the checkpoint file that we had before and then we may want to evaluate an agent uh, as you've seen the Tune API doesn't have the same flexibility as we have with normal agents so we may want to use a different level or we may want to get more insight of what the agent does in the environment so in this case it's better to load the agent's trainer so in this case we load the PPO trainer we restore the checkpoint file that we had and then we can directly access the policy um, in the reinforcement learning loop that we've seen in the random agent example we can call policy.compute action and give it the current observation and it doesn't just return the action 
but it also provides the action distribution, the value function, and any other algorithm specific quantities. For example, it can provide Q values, and then we can use that the best action that the algorithm has and send it to the environment. And then before we move on to the last tutorial on multi-agent reinforcement learning, we have a look at how the multi-agent setup works in Malmo. So, so far we only had single agent examples where each Minecraft instance was attached to a single agent. In the multi-agent setup, there are multiple roles and for each environment there is an agent with role 0 that's going to act as the server and all the other roles are going to act as clients and once we establish the mission all the clients connect to the server and they have this synchronized observation and to do that in code we have to use an additional helper function to create a multi-agent environment where we define the agent configuration so that's where we assign the roles to the agent then we use this turn-based RLE multi-agent env wrapper it's turn-based in the sense that each agent acts at the same time so they are not asynchronously acting in their own time and then in, this, in a similar rate.tune.run function, now we use the multi-agent argument where we define how the policies are defined. So in this example we use a shared policy, which means that both of the agents are going to have identical weights, but they act in a decentralized manner so they don't share information or observation within each other. To do that we also need to define the observation space and the action space and a policy mapping function but you can find more information of this in the RLLib documentation. Okay so after you've trained a PPU agent on the multi-agent setup you should see something like this on the left side the agent is with row 0, it acts as the server and the right side is window is the client and in this mission the agent should collaborate and catch the chicken or they can decide to not collaborate and just move to the send tile which one of the agent does and Sam in the next section is going to talk about ways that you can make reinforcement learning agents learn how to collaborate. So to sum up, what is in the Queen Mary Malmo repository? We added the launcher that wasn't in the previous repository and the updated pip package so it's more convenient to call the launcher for example. And also we have some updated documentation we also have the notebooks that I mentioned previously and we also provide normal Python scripts so if you don't want to use the notebooks it's fine, you can use the scripts instead that might be much easier to use in your own project and we also provide some additional helper functions for example an observation wrapper that just converts the Minecraft observations to any arbitrary size and we also have a video recorder that you could see the single agent recording earlier and we also have a symbolic representation extractor so so far all the examples were based on image inputs and the symbolic representation extractor gives you a top-down view of the symbolic representation of the environment that could be helpful for your project. Uh, finally we provide two PPO checkpoints one for the single agent mob chase mission and one for the two player mob chase mission. Next Sam is going to talk about how to learn to collaborate. Thank you Martin. So I'm Sam Devlin, a senior researcher at Microsoft 
And in this final section, I want to talk a little bit about what happens uh, when we try to apply single agent reinforcement learning to multi-agent tasks, such as the games that we've talked about so far today. And in this section, I want to include some of our recent research that provides scalable approaches to learning coordinated policies in these complex games. So in all the work that we've seen so far today, uh, we've seen issues when applying, directly applying single agent reinforcement learning algorithms to multiplayer tasks. This is why the agents in Martin's section didn't coordinate. In particular, the challenge is that if we just naively place multiple individual learners into the same environment, the environment appears non-stationary to any one of them. That is to say that the same observation and action matches to different outcomes, as the other agents are also updating their policies at the same time in the environment. This causes issues uh, with breaking fundamental assumptions in how single agent reinforcement learning algorithms are designed. Uh, and in particular for deep reinforcement learning, where it's common to use a replay buffer, it can cause issues where these experiences become stale because they're dependent on the previous policies of the other agents in the environment. An alternative approach is to just group all agents as one. So if we're trying to learn a, a joint policy for a group of agents that we're controlling, then why not just stick them all into one big agent that controls all of them? This can be done in certain use cases, uh, but it does lead to an exponential increase in the state action space, which then leads to even more training time needed. And as deep reinforcement learning algorithms are typically very sample intensive, having this exponential increase in the state action space can be very problematic, making it intractable for many people to be able to train agents in this way. From our perspective, looking at gaming applications, even worse than this, it can be considered as cheating. A lot of these games are designed uh, so that you have a partial observability based on where you currently are in that space. So if we allow all the agents in the game to see what everyone else is doing, then that's not how the game is played. Yeah. One way to work around these two issues is to use the paradigm of centralized training for decentralized execution. So in this approach, the agents are considered as one whilst training so we use all of the data that can be generated from all agents during training, and then we learn policies that can be decoupled at the time that we deploy them. Uh, so this framework is used a lot in many modern uh, deep multi-agent reinforcement learning approaches. It uses the same assumption as many recent distributed reinforcement learning algorithms, such as Impala. And it's the simplest but most effective way uh, to, to quickly learn a coordinated policy. Uh, in particular, this gets used to learn a, a, often to learn a centralized critic. And there's an example implementation in the RLlib docs for how to do this with the setup uh, that we've provided and talked about in the earlier sections. In any project where I'm trying to learn coordinated policies for multiple agents, this approach with a centralized critic would always be my first go-to as a safe bet for potentially learning a reasonable enough policy. As we dive deeper into some of the problems that come up, uh, I want to take a look at this particular instance of one of the games that we talked about earlier. In this situation, uh, one of the agents has trapped the mob in the far corner, and the other one is not really doing anything. It's just standing here in the corner looking at what's going on. In a team game where both agents are rewarded the same based on uh, how they're performing as a team, both agents here would receive a positive reward because one of the agents has captured the mob. But the other agent, who's not really helping, will also get a positive reward and so may learn that standing in the corner doing nothing is a useful behavior. This is known as the multi-agent credit assignment problem. How do we break down a global reward so that each agent understands what its contribution is and learns policies that are actually useful to contributing towards the team? One approach to tackle this is difference rewards. Uh, so this was originally proposed by David Wolper and Karl Toomer in a 1999 NASA Tech report under the name The Wonderful Life Utility. Formally, this takes the approach where instead of receiving just the shared team reward that the game gives, each agent instead receives a shaped reward, which is the difference between what the global team reward was and what it would have been if that agent didn't exist or had followed some sort of default policy. By doing so, we get to reward the agents based on their actual contribution to the game, 
rather than how the team is doing overall. If each agent tries to maximize its contribution, then typically the team will perform better. This is a multi-agent specific form of reward shaping designed to remove the noise created by actions of the other agents in the environment. So each agent gets a clear signal about what they are actually contributing to the game. So this approach was proposed originally in 1999 and there was over a decade of very successful applications of this to collaborative games. However, it made one fundamental assumption that you had direct access to the reward function so that you could calculate that right hand, far right hand term uh, where what the global reward would have been if you weren't there or if you'd taken a default action. This isn't always possible and so in this 2004 paper uh, by Mitch Colby, Khan and colleagues, they proposed instead that you learn the reward function so that you can then query it with this for the second turn to find out what it might have been if you weren't in the environment. This line of work was then built on further by Jacob Forrester and colleagues uh, in their AAAI 2018 paper that extended it into a deep reinforcement learning approach where they instead used the value function of a centralized critic. So again, they're using this uh, paradigm of centralized training, decentralized execution. They learn a centralized critic and then they calculate the difference rewards off of the value function from the central value function instead. Uh, this allowed them to scale up to uh, some tasks within StarCraft uh, and other complex games using the, the flexible abilities of deep nets as a value function approximation. In uh, a more recent upcoming paper that I was involved in, we uh, proposed Dr. Reinforce, another deep reinforcement learning approach that instead returns back to the concept of learning the reward function. This is because learning a centralized Q function can be prohibitively challenging. So if we can learn just the reward function rather than having to learn the more forward looking Q function, we might be able to get a, a more efficient way of estimating the difference rewards while still gaining the benefits that Coma had by using deep reinforcement learning to learn our policy. Let's have a look at how this performs in practice. So in this paper, we, we considered a smaller version of our mob chase game, where we have three agents trying to capture a mob or prey uh, pictured as the, the red square. By experimenting in this simpler environment, we were able to compare against earlier methods that had direct access to the reward function. So that, that past decade of work that I, I alluded to earlier. When we have three agents like this, we can see that all methods are performing relatively well. The, the lines in particular to look at here is the green line, at the uh, top left corner is the best performing agent, it learns very quickly to achieve the highest performance. This agent is the one that used the previous assumption that you had access to the reward function, so it's, it can directly calculate the difference reward and not approximate it. Whereas our agent in the dark blue line, which is having to learn the reward function online whilst the agents are acting, is able to recover the same performance fairly quickly after that agent is. But all agents are, are acting fairly similar. Um, we see uh, Coma is also com competitive here uh, and the Colby agent from the original 2014 paper. One of the big things I would take away from this is that any time that you're using difference rewards, they are still outperforming the uh, naive approach of just placing multiple individual learners in the environment. However, as we increase the number of agents in this environment, we see that the, the effect size becomes larger and the methods start to separate. And in this case, we see that our approach using uh, Dr. Reinforce, where it's learning the reward function and still using a deep reinforcement learning approach to learning the policy, is able to handle more agents in the environment, um, which we believe is down to this difficulty in learning the centralized Q function with Coma which is again evidenced in the final plot on the far right where Coma is now performing worse than the original approach by Colby despite having a, a more powerful function approximation for the policy whereas Colby has uh, a more limited version but is again learning the reward function and not the joint Q value. We're still exploring the cause of all of these differences and how this approach scales to more complex environments uh, but this is one approach that has been tested in a wide variety of scenarios for learning more coordinated 
policies and overcoming that challenge of multi-agent credit assignment. So I want to move on now to a slightly different problem and something we saw when we proposed, originally proposed these tasks as a competition in 2018. In that competition, we had a number of participants submit agents that performed very well when playing the games with uh, another instance of their own agent. Right? So if we have the, the two agents in the left box, they perform very well with another instance of itself, uh, similar with the ones on the right. However, if we took one agent from each of these, uh, these teams, so these are two agents trained by different teams, but both perform well when when in the team with another one of themselves, they don't necessarily perform well together. There can be miscoordination due to assumptions that the agent is making about the other agent in its environment. Uh, even more bizarre, uh, we found that if you train two instances of the same agent using exactly the same code base, but just a different random seed, they can often be uncoordinated and not play the game well together. This is known as the ad hoc teamwork problem. What we want is agents it to, to be able to play with any other agent without any prior coordination. So the agents in this competition so far have been have strictly relied on the fact that they have trained with the other agent and that they've formed um, concepts on how they should be taking different roles within that game. But ultimately we want an agent that can recognize who they're playing with and adapt to them so they play online well with them. Formally this extends the normal multi-agent MDP objective, which tries to maximize the accumulated reward of all agents in the environment. To, and the extension just includes an expectation over the other possible agents. So we want it to perform well on average across all agents that it's going to play with in the environment. This was uh, particularly well summed up in this uh, challenge paper from AAAI 2010 by Peter Stone and colleagues where they talk about human ability of ad hoc teamwork to do things like play pickup games of basketball. Right? We should, as humans, be able to play a game that we're good at with anybody that, that we meet, maybe with a brief period of coordination at the beginning, but we shouldn't completely fall apart and not be able to adapt to them. And that's ultimately what we want for the agents and what we're trying to, challenge, take, trying to achieve when taking on the ad hoc teamwork challenge. So to go after this challenge, we proposed this method recently. It's upcoming at the Armas conference this year. Uh, so this looks like a, a, a nightmarish uh, bit of a network, but I can break this down into four simple stages um, where this represents the network that is our policy for this agent. First, we observe the behavior of other agents in our, in our environment. This can be done online whilst the agent is learning, as in this paper, or from a power batch of data, for instance replays of human players playing this game on public servers. Our network architecture includes an information bottleneck through which these observations must be compressed. From this uh, compressed representation, we then try to predict the future actions of the other agents. The error in our predictions can be used to update the parameters in the blue encoder to maximize the information retained from the observations that is needed to predict the future actions. We factor these per agent, which allows us to scale well in the number of agents, but you could also uh, do a joint prediction here over those ac actions of the other agents. From that, that training of the, uh, the top two sections, we get this compressed representation that is a attempting to capture our belief over the other agents. Um, we did this in a way so that the, there are two versions separated here. One that, that will stay stable throughout the entire episode, which is our intention that is trying to capture the play style of the other agent, and another that changes per time step, which is hoping to capture the current mindset. So you might be playing with someone that plays in a particular style, but recognize that they've maybe gone into a particular mode within that style. Um, and we do this uh, with a variational autoencoder-like structure, so we are both capturing our, our, our current mean estimate, but also some variance over this to try and capture some uncertainty over our current belief of the other agent's play styles and mindsets. 
In the final stage, we can then condition our policy on that current belief of the other agents. So instead of just trying to choose an action based off of the current state, we choose our action based off of both the current state and our current belief of the other agents in our environment. If those beliefs are currently highly uncertain, our agent may learn to perform information gathering actions to infer more about the, the other agents in the environment that they're acting with. Or if it's in a critical stage of the game, it may choose to act despite this uncertainty. Uh, for instance, in the mob chase scenario, if the mob was about to escape, the agent might choose to capture it even if it doesn't know that the other agent will be there to support it. Either way, the agent now adapts to others in, in, in its environment, instead of assuming that they will adapt to accommodate the agent. Finally, to demonstrate this approach in practice, I'll show this on another small game that we used in the paper. So, in this game, we have two agents that are collecting coins that they want to take to the bank. Red coins must be taken to the red bank, blue coins to the blue bank. The team is rewarded collectively, so this is a fully collaborative game where they both want to maximize the number of coins they can take to the bank in a fixed period of time. We are controlling the agent with the thought bubble, but we have no control over the agent in the bottom left corner. This agent might have a preference for particular types of coins, might prefer to take the coin that's always closest to it, might always try and take the coin that's furthest away from it. Depending on how that other agent is acting, our agent needs to recognize it and adapt and play the game differently. And what we see when we apply our, our method in this, this approach, so our method is here is the BAMEL approach. Uh, we see far higher average return than some comparative methods from the literature. So first we have the dashed line, dashed gray line, which is a, a typical model free approach with a feed forward network for a policy. So this agent takes no consideration of other agents in the environment. It's just learn on average how to best respond to all of the agents it's seen uh, during training. Alternatively, our approach can be seen as a meta learning approach where it is learned over a population of other agents that it's trained with. So we compare to the RL squared algorithm with the green line which is a state-of-the-art meta-learning approach with a recurrent network. As we can see, both of our approaches significantly outperform these, these two baseline approaches. If we look a little deeper into this, we can also see uh, p a potential cause for why this is happening. So in this next plot, what we're trying to do here is predict what the other agent is in the environment. So this wasn't a part of the training loop for either agent. But what we do is once the agents are trained, or at various time steps throughout training, we take the current intermediate representation and attempt to predict from that what the other agent is. Uh, so this is a separate uh, supervised learning problem uh, just to use to probe what is, what is being learned in the intermediate representations of these agents. And what we see is that from the intermediate layers of the RL squared agent, it remains throughout training quite challenging to predict what the other agent is doing. So this agent is not retaining information about what the other agent in the environment is doing. Whereas with our BAMEL approach, that intermediate representation can, after training, uh, be used to, to accurately predict what the other agent is, showing that it is retained information critical to understanding who this agent is playing with. So to close, I, I just want to summarize some of the core problems that occur in multi-agent reinforcement learning and some of the methods that we've talked about today to overcome them. First, if we just naively place multiple single agent reinforcement learning algorithms into the same environment, then we introduce the problem of non-stationarity, which breaks many standard assumptions in RL algorithms, uh, causing them not necessarily to converge towards an optimal policy. Secondly, we have the curse of dimensionality, where if we put all of these agents into one monolithic agent that has to control all of them, then we get an exponential growth in the state action space, which can be intractable to learn. Then we talked about the multi-agent credit assignment problem, where it's hard for an agent to understand from a global team reward what it did to contribute towards that, that team score. Uh, and so here we talked about difference rewards as an approach to give more informed credit to the agents that actually contributed to the success of the team. And finally, we talked about ad hoc teamwork 
and this is the problem of uh, an agent that has to generalize to another agent which it does, hasn't previously coordinated with. So how do you learn an, an agent's policy that can generalize to a wide range of other partner agents that they might play with? We talked a little bit about some approaches to this, but interested listeners, uh, I would recommend these two surveys too, um, that cover a wide range of past methods, both uh, from the sort of deep pre-deep reinforcement learning era in the first survey from 2008, and also a very recent survey that covers a large portion of the, the approaches that have been proposed more recently in the deep reinforcement learning paradigm. The approaches that I've covered today have not yet been tested in the multi-agent Minecraft tasks my collaborators presented earlier. So I invite all those on the call today to try these approaches out and would love to hear the learnings of anybody in the audience that gained uh, insights by applying these approaches in those multi-agent problems in Minecraft. Finally, before we start the Q&A session, I would just like to invite you all to join us for our upcoming AI and Gaming Research Summit which will be taking place on February 23rd and 24th, 2021. There's a link there uh, for registration and for uh, any of the resources that we make available after the event. Uh, this will be a great opportunity to learn about a far wider range of research in this area, uh, looking both at AI agents in other settings, but also topics such as responsible gaming, computational creativity, and understanding players. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, many thanks to all of you for attending the Reflutal Learning in Minecraft seminar today um, and also for staying for this live Q&A. So I'm uh, Diego Perez, I'm, I'm one of the co -present, uh, the presenters of this webinar uh, with me, uh, Raluca Gaina, Martin Bala and Sam Devlin who will be also answering your questions. Um, you have probably seen that we've uh, answered already some of your questions in the chat uh, and now we're going to take uh, some extra questions uh, that have uh, been submitted by you uh, we've selected to reply uh, live now. So let's get started with this. Um, the first one is uh, is a question uh, submitted by Lucas from the University of Edinburgh. And uh, I'll, I'll read the question now. Um, so did you observe for the vain ML meta-learning work that the variance and uncertainty of the VAE was interpretable? Uh, could you, uh, for example, observe that the variance increase whenever the other agents exhibited behavior rarely or not seen during training before, and hence encoding the play styles could be difficult. Um, I think uh, Sam is going to answer this. Sure thing. Uh, thanks for the question, Lucas. Uh, so, in in the example that we showed in the talk, uh, it was a little harder for us to interpret what was in the latent representation learned by the VAE due to the size that we uh, we chose to encode it as. However, in the paper that supports this work, we did look at a game with, uh, where we were able to use a far smaller latent representation, and there it was a very interpretable um, representation that was learned. So we see things like that it was counting the actions that the other agents were taking, that it was clearly separating uh, the different types of agents that it trained against. In all of those cases, what we did see was that the variance would reduce over time uh, when it was recognizing a behavior. So once it uh, had seen from the history that it, it had more confidence over which agent it was playing with. But what we didn't explore was looking at how do we generalize beyond agents that are in that, that training set. So I think that's the, the really exciting part in, in Lucas's question about having the agent actually recognize uh, when it's playing with someone that it doesn't recognize. I, I think that's a really key thing for future work. These agents need to be able to learn how to uh, acknowledge that they're in a position where they don't understand what's going on, and so take more information gathering actions. Uh, I know Lucas and the, the team at Edinburgh are also working on this, so I'm really keen to see what they do in that space. Maybe he has something to, to share with us all soon. Right, thank you. Um, so the next question is by Dowei Tang uh, from Q11. Uh, there are actually quite a few questions in one, so I'm going to split this in, in two parts. Uh, so starting with uh, with the first one, is, is the design of the structure of the deep neural network important in RL? Uh, do you use a general neural network for different games? And um, are these hyperparameters of the DNN uh, tuned for every game? Yeah, so uh, another good question. 
Yeah, I, I, I can jump on that. Um, so another good question. Uh, obviously, ideally, we wouldn't want to have to be tuning these specifically for every single game. But in practice, that's still the way we're mostly doing things. Uh, there's a very interesting line of work on making DeepRL uh, more generalizable, more robust. Uh, and this is something we explored. Uh, I posted a, a paper in the questions to our Neurips 2019 paper on this topic. Uh, so we, we're definitely exploring options for, for network architectures that allow more generalization. We've particularly found that the uh, variational information bottleneck is beneficial for doing so. Um, but still a wide open question, particularly for looking at that, that uh, challenge of generalizing across different games. Uh, we're also exploring this from another perspective of uh, working with uh, colleagues at MSR New York from a more cognitive neuroscience background, are looking at more sort of neuro-inspired architectures that can encode more human-like priors to get more human-like behavior out of our agents that we hope would then be broadly applicable to a whole range of games. And as, as a follow-up, uh, if, if, if this input is an image, uh, do you need a state-of-the-art image processing or a simple model can be used? Uh, so, so this is somewhere where our team differs a little bit. We we work very closely with game studios and with the uh, in this instance with the Malmo, uh, the way Malmo is set up, we can get access to more low level game state from the game itself. Uh, we don't see an advantage in many of our games for operating at that sort of per pixel level. So a lot of this work is done off of uh, a lower level game state, taking access to taking the advantage of the fact that we have access to the game. So we can learn a lot more uh, sample efficient than uh, doing things at the the pixel level. Okay, fantastic. Um, we have another question from Ashwin uh, with Vinay uh, from the University of Buffalo. Um, considering that this is a stochastic environment, uh, how do we how do the agents act based on the probability, and are the choice of states random or based on certain transition probability? And I think Sam, Sam can also reply to it. Sure. So um, for the majority of the work that we do, we use uh, policy gradient or actor critic based algorithms so that we can learn stochastic policies, uh, particularly in multi-agent settings. This is very important. Um, I think quite followed the second half of this. So the, the choice of states uh, will very much be based off of the transition probability within the environment. It is probabilistic, but these algorithms are able to deal with that. The part that we do sometimes randomize, though, is about uh, generating lots of different instances so that the agents get trained in different settings. Uh, this is both for um, making the agents more robust, this is a method popularly known as domain randomization, uh, but it's also something that we do in, in these, uh, these environments when we run them as competitions to ensure that we could provide test set environments that the uh, participants hadn't previously trained on. All right. Uh, I hope that covers you. it. <laughs> okay. Um, there's another question by Hamza. Sorry if I'm pronouncing the, the name incorrectly. From Rice University. Um, so I'm a student. I don't know too much about employing reinforcement learning in games. Uh, how would you recommend uh, I get started with this field? Uh, and I believe uh, Martin Bala can answer this. Anyone? Yeah. So this is a good question. I would recommend starting by learning a bit about the theory of reinforcement learning. Um, there are some good lectures on YouTube that you can follow. Um, then I recommend you picking up Python programming if you don't know it already. Um, then OpenAI's team have very good examples to get started with it. Okay, so thank you. Uh, let's see, I have other questions um, from Kim Biao Lee um, from the University of Cambridge. Uh, re recent research in graph neural networks also have been actively investigated to build up decentralized multi agent problems. Related work show that this can be helpful for generalization performance that train in 10 agents but tested in a larger scale, as also addressed in your work. Have you considered the applications of GNN uh, in your team? Um, I know Sam, if you can uh, answer to this in your team. 
Sure. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not something we've experimented with yet, um, but it is a very exciting direction. Uh, I, again, I know that uh, Jingbao and the, the group at Cambridge are doing some really exciting work in this space, so uh, we'd love to see uh, if that can scale to to these tasks in Marlowe. Like this, this is why we put these environments out there, really, is to see uh, see how the, the uh, community can sort of engage with these problems and try out these different approaches. Uh, it's only so much bandwidth within one team to try out new ideas, but graph neural networks are definitely a very powerful tool for approaching these. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to leave a couple of minutes in case somebody else has another question. So I did. I did have one uh, that that I didn't get quite around to responding to in my in my badge. Uh, so from Sagar Ubredi at the University of Warwick asked how we define mindset in the uh, the paper on ad hoc teamwork. Um, and so here we 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 weren't explicitly defining them. Uh, essentially, we have two variables in the latent representation, one that's only sampled once per game and one that's being sampled per time step. And so really, the, the labeling of it as a mindset is more just a way for us to uh, interpret and communicate our intention with those two different components. It's actually something that was originally defined in the Machine Theory of Mind paper a few years back. Um, I can't remember the reference directly off my head, but it's it is cited in the paper for where that one came from. Uh, but yeah, so the the mindset I believe was the per time step one. So we capture the the overall play style with the per episode. So you have a a particular play style that you adhere to throughout uh, when you play. Whereas the mindset is more that sort of moment to moment reaction and how these might change based on what's currently going on. That's great, thank you. Uh, this is another question uh, by uh, Yusuf Liu from QMUL. Uh, it says, uh, hello, in terms of learning other agents in multi-agent platform, uh, how to learn the other agent efficiently, uh, given the data for the other agent is, is too limited? In addition, can the method of learning uh, other agents be implemented into an adversarial game to learn uh, about an foreign agent? Um, well, uh, actually, multi-agent multi learning is something that has been uh, has been researched for, for many, many years. It's one of the main uh, research question that exists uh, at the moment. Um, and normally, what the people try to do uh, at the moment is try to, to implement or create a, a model of the of the opponent by basically trying to analyze uh, the, the, try to learn the policy that this, this opponent is going to be executing uh, by basically studying data for playing uh, often against, against these games, against these, uh, these agents, and trying to um, build this, this model um, in, a, in a more or less dynamic manner. Um, I, I don't know if, if anyone else wants to uh, add something else uh, to this or any particular ways in which uh, maybe Microsoft uh, is doing this in your research? Yeah, so, so, so I think um, the, the example I presented at the end was probably the, the best one I, I have to mind of us learning that model. Uh, in a competitive game, it's absolutely the case that if, if you learn the model, then that, that's a way to exploit a particular opponent um, beyond playing just a Nash equilibria that's safe against uh, and robust to a whole range of opponents. Um, in, the, in the paper that's linked for the ad hoc teamwork setting, we do have a game that is uh, more competitive than, than the example that I showed. Uh, so it, it, it is equally applicable in that setting. Uh, but I'm really motivated by that application of using it for fully collaborative games. I mean, ideally, what we want is for these agents to empower the player and enable the player to do more rather than exploit them or, or try to beat them. Um, it's quite easy to make agents that are very good at games and beat people. Uh, it's much more fun to create agents that can allow more people to enjoy games. Hey, 
Um, see that there are no more questions coming up. Uh, we can we wait a minute just in case somebody's typing. Probably a good chance just to, to uh, make sure everybody's seen the, the invite and the resource list to our AI and Gaming Summit next week. Uh, so the registration is open until tomorrow, so please do sign up today if you're interested. There's uh, there's going to be a lot of work there that's going to span a range of different topics in game AI, uh, including lots of stuff on uh, collaborative agents, collaborating with humans, uh, but also going into things such as computational creativity, responsible gaming, and understanding players. So hopefully of wide interest to people on this, this call today. Agree. Okay, so I think we we might be ready to start wrapping up. Um, so thank you, thank you all for attending today. Uh, we appreciate uh, your participation, your questions, uh, your interest in the subject. Um, this uh, tutorial is going to be available on demand very very shortly as, after this Q and A uh, finishes. Uh, and if you are interested to uh, learn more, as Sam just said, we have a list of uh, great resources in the resource list uh, to the right of your screen. Uh, so, so you can see what's there. Uh, we do have the presentation slides that uh, that this uh, webinar uh, we've been using in the webinar. We have a couple of links to the project Malmo, the actual uh, research project in, in Microsoft Research, and also the uh, the link to the latest repository uh, in in GitHub. So you can you can find the the, the final uh, examples and the final code that has been implemented. Uh, there are also a couple of references to relevant papers that uh, we have been mentioning today during the during the webinar. Uh, so there are, there are two uh, two references to archive papers, and as also Sam just just mentioned, uh, the last one is, uh, is is a link to the AI and Gaming Research Summit, who is happening uh, next week, 23rd and 24th of February. Uh, the registration is free, uh, but uh, it's going to be uh, closing tomorrow. So basically, try to register by tomorrow at the latest. Um, it's it's going to be a, a very very interesting event. There's lots lots of different uh, topics being uh, um, covered in the event. Uh, two two full days of of work uh, and talk on RL and game AI and, and so on. Yeah, so definitely check check that up. Um, and and we will we look forward to seeing you uh, see how you build all of this research and how you push further uh, the boundaries of uh, RL. Uh, and game AI, uh, and we're looking forward to seeing your your work. So thank you again for tuning in, and have a great day.